Great. Thank you, Deidre, and welcome, everyone. My name is Kathy Miller, and I am the Executive Director of the Rochester Regional Library Council, one of the nine councils that comprise the NY3Rs Association, the sponsor of today's program. I'm also the facilitator for the statewide NY3Rs work group on libraries as publishers. Libraries as publishers is one of the six statewide priorities that are part of a plan called an Information Infrastructure for New York, or I to New York, and there's a slide up on your screen now. The plan was created through a series of meetings and surveys of all New York libraries. There are six work groups being facilitated by the NY3Rs. The five other groups are enhancing access to research databases, participation in the Digital Public Library of America, clearinghouse and communications, outcomes and assessments, and staff training, retraining, and exchanges. And you can find more about each of these on the NY3Rs website, www.ny3rs.org. Now a little bit more about our priority, libraries as publishers. This is a new role for libraries, but what's it all about? Library as publisher encompasses many, many different activities. So far in our series, we've heard about the SUNY Open Textbook Project in which librarians are working with faculty to produce e-textbooks for use across SUNY. We also heard from the folks at Rochester Public Library who turned vanity publishing into community engagement through production of a highly successful self-published author's fair. And last month, we learned about how the Eastman School of Music is selling scores on a site called librarycommerce.com and how that site might be expanded to include materials from other libraries. Today's program, using the IR to document and disseminate faculty papers and scholarship, takes us into another area of library publishing, the institutional repository. We hope that all five of the online discussions, which are being recorded, as Dietra said, uh, will inspire your library to become a publisher for your community, whatever that community is. At the end of this series in the summer, the NY3Rs Association will be offering seed money through a grant opportunity for a library or libraries in New York to undertake an innovative library publishing project. More information on all of this, as I said, can be found on the NY3Rs website. But now on to today's presentation, using the IR to document and disseminate faculty papers and scholarship. Our guests are Kim Myers from Drake Library, the College of Brockport, and Yuan Li, recently from Syracuse University, but now at Princeton. Kim is the Digital Repository Manager for the College of Brockport's Institutional Repository, Digital Commons at Brockport. Kim was the 2013 recipient of the NYLA ASLS NY3R's Special Project Grant, which enabled her to attend a scholarly publishing certification course last fall. She also received a Conversations and Disciplines Grant through SUNY to host the prom Promoting Scholarly Communications Through Open Access Journals Conference this past spring. Uh, and I hope you had an opportunity to attend that. Yuan Li is the brand new Scholarly Communications Librarian at Princeton University, where she will manage the Princeton University's library's efforts to support scholarly publication innovations and reforms. And she will also supervise and coordinate activities related to the Princeton Open Access Policy and the Princeton Institutional Repository. Prior to joining Princeton, she served as the Scholarly Communications Librarian at Syracuse University from 2011 through 2014, and she built SU's repository from its infancy. Welcome, Kim and Yuan. We are anxious to learn more about your experiences with your institutional repositories. And listeners, a reminder, as Dietrich said during the presentation, uh, just put your quest pose your questions in the chat box, and we will be responding to them at the end of our presentation. Um, as time allows. So now, I think first we're going to hear from Kim. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Kim Myers, and I am the Digital Repository Specialist at the College at Brockport. As Kathy mentioned, Yuan and I will be sharing our experiences with starting an institutional repository. We're going to touch on such issues as implementation, recruitment, impact, and how it fits into the model of library as publisher.
So a little about Drake Memorial Library. Drake Memorial Library serves the college at Brockport's campus population of 8,000 undergraduate and graduate students and 1,300 faculty and staff. It supports Digital Commons at Brockport with a full-time repository manager and participation from much of the library staff. Digital Commons at Brockport was launched in January of 2012 following a successful Kickstart program. We have now completed five semesters, have over 3,000 documents, and are approaching half a million downloads. Digital Commons is important to the library as a form of outreach, a disseminator of scholarship, and as part of our scholarly communication program. And I'd like to add, Digital Commons is also becoming a part of the culture of the college. So what's involved in starting an IR? I'm going to touch on four little bullet points today, although I could spend a whole presentation just on this topic. But the four things I'll talk about is perceiving a need, choosing your software, institutional support, and staffing. So first, consider how an IR could meet an existing or perceived need for you. For Brockport, the need came in the form of a faculty learning community who wanted to start a journal to showcase top student work for our annual Scholars Day presentation. In terms of software, this need led us to look at many different platforms, including open source ones, such as open journal systems, as well as hosted ones, such as Digital Commons. We ultimately went with Digital Commons. The reason we did this was so we could focus on content rather than on technical issues, such as building the platform. And because we were impressed with the ease of use, their excellent customer support, and their great discoverability on search engines. This platform has allowed us to do much more than just publish a journal. We also have theses, image galleries, full text monographs, and a wide range of other publications in it. And I invite you to browse our repository later at digitalcommons.brackport.edu. So garnering institutional support from key stakeholders is an essential to ensure a successful implementation of your repository. We did numerous presentations across campus to deans and chairs, the provost, and the president's cabinet. This helped us get faculty buy-in when the time came. This also led us to a key stakeholder, our college webmaster, who, after becoming aware of us, has sent many collections our way. And the final thing I want to talk about on this slide is staffing. While we have a full-time repository manager, the expectation to participate in Digital Commons is also written into all new librarian job descriptions. In fact, 78% of all of our librarians play an important role in our IR in jobs ranging from journal editors to collection administrators. So another thing to consider is what kind of policies you want to have in place. We didn't have a lot of policies beyond the policy of careful copyright compliance when we first began the IR. And as we complete our, first, our second year, it's becoming obvious to me that it's time to convene an advisory committee to grapple with issues such as offering embargoes for theses or maybe even hosting outside work. But in the beginning, 
we just operated under a few simple tenants. First, we decided our IR would be organically grown. And by this, I mean that we put content before structure. Some repositories choose to build the structure or communities in their IR first and add collections later. But we knew we wanted to use the approach where we built collections and added the community structure over it. But there are pros and cons to both methods. We also knew we wanted to be a full service repository, meaning we would provide rights checking and uploading for all collections. And finally, we decided to only put in articles for which we had the right to post the actual publisher's PDF and not link out to articles in the databases. One significant example or exception to this is the links we have to 342 of our catalog records for books written by past and present Blackport faculty. We were able to add the full text of 23 of these monographs, and these account for almost 10,000 of our downloads so far. So once you have the structure for your repository, you need to think about content. How do you get contributors for your IR? We started by identifying areas that made Blackport unique. And we initially focused on our programs of, of distinction, including phys ed or KISPE, business, math and science, and dance. We approached these faculty first to add their faculty publications. These publications seeded the repository when we went live, and we then branched out to other unique Blackport collections. We have a large collection of archival material, everything from local history books to alumni lists. These are very popular, perhaps with genealogists as well as alumni. In our first year, we started two student journals and added the counselor education theses, which had been languishing in a departmental hard drive for the previous six years. We also published a monograph from a special seminar held in 1979 titled, Who Will Take Care of Me in 2020? A Speculative Look at Government-Funded Long-Term Care. This work is still of interest today because it chronicles the earlier attempts to deal with rising health care costs and provide insight into some kind of into some of the policy and administrative remedies under current discussion. And finally, in our first year, we focused on developing the signature collection, the water resources of Great Lakes and, the, and New York State. And this continues to be an important collection and garners national interest. We will hear Dr. McCarowitz himself a little later. So isn't this the truth? As money gets tighter, demonstrating impact becomes increasingly important. And we look to our strategic plans for the guidelines that we use to demonstrate the impact of our repository. And although we promote our repository through presentations, announcements in the Daily Eagle, we use our annual report to our stakeholders to, where, to show where the evidence of our impact all in one place. And you can download that right here if you wish to see it later. So, From, this is a little bit of our strategic plan um, and the things that we use to as our goals. So they come from our departmental strategic plan as well as the college mission. 
Our college mission is to become a nationally recognized, comprehensive master's institution focused on student success. We support this work or this mission by posting our graduate theses, which account for more than half of our downloads, and by hosting an annual graduate research conference on our repository. The repository also supports the strategic goals in many other ways, whether it's housing gray literature such as technical reports, publishing four different journals, two each for faculty and student, and we're adding four more in the next year, or working with various departments to showcase their scholarship. And finally, I'd like to share Certainly, in terms of digital commons, I think for us it has some, some meaning to the college itself in that what it's done, uh, at least within this particular field, is that it's focused attention on the college as a center for environmental research and resources. Uh, needless to say, that has led to more students coming here. From my perspective, besides enhancing the reputation of the college, it certainly has done that to myself in that it now uh, provide some information to people that I'm a leader in the field and that I'm involved in the field. So besides attracting graduate students, it's also surprisingly led to a number of counties coming forth and suggesting that they may be willing to fund some research and scholarship in these areas. And finally, uh, you know, one of the uh, major concerns for me was that we had done about $4 million worth of work in terms of government money, local government money, and now these historical data sets were, in fact, um, available to the general public as well as to agencies and leads to development of policy and management in the area. OK, I hope everyone could hear that. Um, this was the words of Dr. Joseph Makarowicz. He's a SUNY Distinguished Professor of Environmental Science and Biology, and he is, is and has been one of our repository's staunchest supporters. So this is a little bit about how we've made it work for us, and here are some questions to think about for yourself. How do you make this work? Well, the first question to ask is, is there a need for this in your community? Do you want to go open source or hosted? There are costs and um, choices involved in both. What resources do you have available to you, both in terms of collections that are available and staffing options? And finally, and perhaps the most important is, what makes your collections unique? Because this is what is going to bring people to your repository. So I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, and I'm going to turn this over now to Kathy. And we'll be happy to answer questions at the end. So thank you very much. Thank you, Kim. That's really fascinating. And I think we will have a lot of questions. Um, we're going to now hear uh, from uh, Yuan uh, Lee. Uh, Yuan is at a large university. Of course, Kim is at a small, relatively small academic institution. There's information from Kim. And we'll be, uh, feel free to chat in questions. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Yuan. Hello. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you all for having me here to share my experience at Syracuse in using the RR to document and disseminate institutional, scholarly, creative, and cultural records. Here is a brief agenda for my talk in the next 15 minutes. Uh, I know it's a lot to cover. As Kim said, probably each of them we can easily talk about for one hour, uh, but today we just have a limited time, and then we basically speak on a high-level point. 
So first, before I start, I want to give you some context for our RR, then speak from uh, our experience, things that you might need to consider when starting and implementing an IR, tell you stories, how we recruited our contributors at the beginning, developed our services, promoted them on campus later on, and demonstrated the impact that our R has made on campus and beyond. At the end, I'd like to talk a little bit my perspective on how the R fits into the notion of library as publisher. Syracuse University is a private university with the total uh, student enrollment of over 20,000 um, 1,043 full-time faculty and over 3,000 full-time staff. Overall, we are a fairly big institution. SU Libraries is the university library system, including Burr Library, Carnegie Library, Belfort Audio Archives, Geology Library, Architecture Reading Room, and the library facility. We have 3.5 million titles and 176 FTE. The libraries have nine departments. I want to point to here um, that library have its own IT department and the university press is part of the library. But the university archives is not. It's separate and it's operate on its own. SU's Institutional Repository Surface. Surface is an um, acronym for Syracuse University Research Facility and a Collaborative Environment. It was launched in October 2010. By this month, after three years and a half, it has over 10,000, close to 10,000 items and seven, over 7,000, um, 700,000 downloads. We um, have close to 350 um, faculty who are participating. Uh, kind of contributing to our RR from 23 departments, College of Law, I School, and the School of Architecture. In addition to uh, those academic departments, um, Honors Program, University Archives, the Graduate School, Office of the Chancellor, and then the libraries are also contributing too. This is uh, just a brief screenshot our, um, of our re institution repository surface. Um, I have to cut it in half. Unfortunately, because it's it's too big to fit in one slide, you, I have a link there. Uh, feel free to check it out yourself. Um, it has actually a spin wheel um, graphics on the bottom. Um, it's much prettier for the actual page. I think as a Surface team right now is in the process of implementing a dynamic usage map on the home page, which will be making Surface more interesting. Okay, finally. Starting and implementing an IR. I think um, Kim already addressed pretty, mu pretty much of it. Uh, I just wanted to note some high-level points that we have been um, through during our implementation um, process. Uh, when I came into a scholarly communications library, librarian position at a Syracuse in May 2011, <clears throat> Surface was already launched and implemented. I wasn't really involved in the process. But I can share with you something that my colleagues shared with me. Um, I'd like to especially thank my colleagues, Sarah Timer and Suzanne Prey 8, uh, who shared this information with me, uh, which really helped me to do my work later on. Sarah is a principal cataloger and a med day librarian, and Suzanne is a digital initiative librarian at Syracuse University Libraries. Both of them were on Surface Implementation Group, and now they are a core part of the Surface Management team. Um, I'll have their emails available in my last slide. I believe they will be happy to answer uh, your questions, if any. Um, speaking of Im start and implement uh, IR, uh, before the implementation, you might want to think about your timeline um, so that you can do better planning and place your process well, pace your process well. Uh, you may even want to set up a launch date so that you can keep your team on target. After the timeline set up, uh, the first thing you will need to figure out is what platform you're going to use, right? Uh, and that, that's, uh, there, are, there are vendors a solution, there is open source software, it all depends on your, re your available resources and your needs. Uh, at our, in our case, we use DigiCommons, even though we have our own IT department, but they have reached um, to their maximum capacity, so we choose DigiCommons so that we um, don't need so much technical support and we can focus on, focus on the content as, as um, Kim said um, earlier. 
And you probably, after that, you probably also wanted to think who you want to be involved in the implementation team as implementing an IR uh, involves multiple tasks which will need different expertise. Um, in our case, when um, our, uh, our implementation team was a big group, including librarians from different departments um, in SEO libraries, uh, librarians from law library, staff and students from iSchool, SU Press, and the university archives. So during the implementation, you need to decide what do you want to tackle down. Um, there is some pretty straightforward tasks like uh, home page design, metadata structure, collection organization, and also permissions, copyright agreement, etc. Those are um, probably you need to uh, tackle down um, immediately before you launch the um, RR. Other tasks like policies, including collection development policy, preservation policy, access and use, etc. And a workflow, those that you can decide whether or not you want to deal with during implementation or afterwards. Uh, for us, we um, have um, a, a we have break down our team to eight subcommittees uh, working on different tasks, including design, metadata structure, collection development criteria, um, repository content inventory, file formats, workflow, rights permission, and accessibility. Recruiting contributors. We started from so-called low-hanging fruits which are the publications already available somewhere or publications with no much copyright issues. We have visited articles from open disciplinary repositories like Archive, Repack, and SSRN, then ask the permission from faculty to put those publications in our uh, repository. We also identified some department-generated and owned materials, like the working papers from Center for Policy Research, the technical reports from Department of Electronic Engineer and Computer Science, um, et cetera. Um, dissertations and the thesis is another big collection that we started with. Here I'd like to um, know that uh, it's from my um, colleague Sarah, and when you kick off your IR, you want to have a fair number of items in it so that it creates a better image for the institution and more faculty will want to add to it. That is a big reason why we decided to identify the easiest material to add and get them all in quickly before the official service launch. During the uh, process for recruitment, the subject, I mean, content recruitment, subject librarians or liaisons really play a critical role, at least in my case. Um, when I said earlier that we ask a faculty for permission, we let a faculty know service, or we identify um, department-generated materials, uh, when I said a way, that really means they, the libraries, liaisons. I'm the person to um, set up approaches and the workflows. Um, they are the uh, people who are working at the frontiers and make things happen. So I would recommend you uh, work uh, to uh, working with your liaisons, uh, liaison librarians very closely for content recruitment and uh, promotion, uh, our promotion. Developing our, our services. For the first year and a half, the service team has been using a simple strategy to recruit content, which is collecting the low-hanging fruits. It's very effective at the beginning of a stage of development. However, a strategy for truly sustainable growth of RR should focus on the RR value-added services. In the beginning of 2013, four services were developed out of RRR and pushed out to the campus. They are repository services, digital archiving services, e-scholarship services, and digital publishing services. Repository services um, is to provide a space in our RR for our committee members um, who want to build their own open digital collections. For example, we had a down project with creative writing program. Uh, we offer a space in our R collection space, and then um, they host their video collections from uh, Raymond Cover reading series. It's, it's uh, ongoing events like every semester, so the videos has been adding um, constantly, like every semester regularly. Digital archiving services it's really um, serve surface as our institute repository as a, a digital archive space archival. Uh, we had a lot of projects with um, with our university archives. East 
scholarship services support faculty and the researchers in self-archiving, disseminating, and promoting scholarship in digital form. We help faculty to build their research profile in our IR, help them um, check the copyright policy from publisher, clear copyright for their public Applications, request permissions um, if it's needed, and upload the publication uh, to their personal research file profile in our IR. Um, as Kim said, it's a full services. Um, the project that we had had done and it's keep going is is the uh, with the one with David Co uh, Ford College of Sport and Human Dynamics. We worked with their staff and the students to create the faculty's personal research profile and uh, populate them. Digital publishing services. We help faculty and students publishing journals and books. The libraries not only using Digital Commons for publishing services, we also adopted the OGS for publishing project, which has a high demand of a customization uh, that Digital Commons cannot accommodate. Um, SU Library is I had, had made a lot of effort in digital publishing, library publishing. Um, SU Library is one of the founding members of Library Publishing Coalition. And last fall, the libraries formed a library publishing initiatives, initiatives group in collaboration with SU Press and tried to expand and structure a suite of services, uh, publishing services for campus. Um, as you can see, these services from IR not only meet the new needs, on campus, but also ensure the steady growth of our IR. Promoting an IR. Once the surface has been developed, it comes down to the promotion. You have to let people know what you can do for them. There are many ways you can promote. You can promote through um, group presentations, like the department faculty meetings. Again, working with your subject librarians to get you scheduled for one of, um, of those meetings. Individual consultations meet with faculty or student individually to address their specific needs. Again, um, the subject li liaisons and the librarians are our years and the mouths, and then they can refer faculty and students to us. Work with officer research officers, of faculty de development, and other partners on campus to include to include you or me as part of their events to promote our RR. For example, I have been included in office of research training sessions for faculty and the faculty launch series that are organized by Office of Faculty Development. Uh, OA events is another great opportunity to promote your IR. You can organize events that invite faculty to talk about the benefits of using your IR, and you can set up information desk for your IR. You can do all kinds of things to promote your IR during OA week. Um, of course, brochures, websites, emails um, are other viable ways to promote. Demonstrating the impact. After we set up the IR, promoted, ran it, people started using it, it comes to the assessment. We need to measure our success and demonstrate the impact so that we can confirm the administration that their investment is worthy. As what Kim did, I also write the annual report for Surface every year. In the report, I demonstrate the impact using numbers, charts, and graphics. And believe it or not, the administrations love the statistical figures. Although the data cannot tell the whole story, but it provides them a big picture of how well we're doing. I often um, share the numbers in the report. I I often share in the report the numbers of items to date in the repository, the number of downloads we got through the whole world, the whole um, the, the growth chart based on the past and the current data, usage, global usage maps, number of faculty who are using our services, number of projects we have done or have been doing, uh, the departments and other campus partners that we have been collaborating with. All those information showed how we meet the campus needs for digital scholarship management, dissemination, and preservation. Another convincing element to demonstrate the, the impact is the feedback from our contributors and the users. I often also include the quotes from um, contributors and the users stating that how helpful our, our services are in terms of a digital scholarship management, dissemination, and promotion, preservation. Fitting in the notion of library as a publisher, um, 
I think the institution repository really enables us to do a lot of things that we weren't able to do that publishers does that publisher does. Publishers do publish new journals in the books, and through our our um, and other system like OGS, we do it too. And publisher organize a peer review process. We can facilitate peer review process using RR and and or other system if needed. Publisher catalog and disseminate arrange um, like deliver original uh, content, scholarly content, and then we do it too through our RR. And we even do it better because we provide open access. Uh, so to some extent, I think you can't call library as publisher, even though it's it's really not in full capacity or in a traditional sense. Uh, but I think the library publishing service really serves the new publishing needs uh, that won't won't cover by traditional publishing. I believe library publishing will be seen as an important strategic purposeful service area that adds value to the whole publishing ecosystem. And RR is one of I think I think R is one of those infrastructures that makes this happen. Um, speaking of library as a publisher, I think um, here I want to know that um, Rebecca Kennison um, and her um, colleague come up a white paper that it's it's kind of a, a model for the library publishing um, kind of overall landscape and I think I will recommend you guys to read that and it's very um, um, uh, thought broking um, it's it's very thorough and then um, I recommend to read that but uh, overall um, I think that's all for today. Thank you all for your participation. I have my emails as well as Sarah's and the students here. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us and then we can definitely talk a little bit more um, after the webinar. Um, thank you. Okay, Yuan, thank you so much. It's uh, really interesting to hear the two different perspectives from the smaller public uh, uh, college and then also from the private larger college. So we do have some questions coming in from our listeners. And uh, Jane uh, asked from uh, SUNY ESF, did Brockport or SU consider using B Press uh, as your um, platform. And Kim, uh, do you want to speak first? Sure. Um, both SU and Brockport use Digital Commons, which is the B Press IR vendor prop. So yes, we do use B Press. Yes. OK, so both of you had decided that uh, right. um, in terms of the uh, SUNY, they have DSpace. Did you consider that at all? We had, so we've had DSpace for a number of years, and when we went, um, started using Digital Commons, I went and looked at what was in DSpace to try and import it. Turned out there were five articles in there, three of which were the same article three different times. Our users had found it both clunky to use and not very well search engine optimized so you couldn't really find the material in there and these are two of the things that really we liked the most about B press in terms of you know it's type in something into Google you're going to find us if we have it in our repository and they have great customer support support and you don't have to worry about technical issues they do it for you from uh, the information that my colleagues have shared with me um, they probably look at uh, the platform like DSpace, um, but the, we decided to you go with um, Digital Commons because we, we don't really have enough uh, support or resources to uh, adopt uh, the open source software. Okay, we have a question from Cynthia. Could you on say a little bit more about the staffing support for all of the repository services offered at SU? Um, okay. Basic. It's really a um, one-person workshop. Like I'm, I'm a scholarly communication librarian, and uh, I take care of uh, outreach as well as the management of the uh, institution repository. But I do have a team, um, which I mentioned several times, and a Suzanne Pre-Aid. Um, three of us, a uh, core um, 
serve as like a daily operation management team. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we I can get a lot of help from our uh, staffers from other departments. Uh, for example, Learning Commons has four staff contributing five hours each week for project for surface project, and I constantly also um, collaborated with. Um, department of staff, you know, kind of we just trying to find resources and that support um, for our services uh, re institution repository projects. But we don't have a dedicated. Oh, I sh I should have mentioned that um, I you know, we just got it's it's since this is spring we got a half time uh, staff from cataloging. Um, basically, focusing on folks uh, surface project. Um, I, before I was having uh, a few student helpers. Uh, that's all the staffing for RIR. Okay, that's great. Kim, can you comment at all about the support you have? Sure. Like I said, um, when we started Digital Commons, we committed to having a full-time manager for one year, and that was a couple of years ago. My job hasn't gone away at all, but we. Um, we don't have other people that are full time doing this at all. Our archive um, librarian, Charlie Collins, probably spends maybe a fifth to a quarter of his time um, with Digital Commons. He's our second biggest user or um, administrator in Digital Commons. He has lots of archival materials, and he handles all of that. Um, beyond that, I have a student. And uh, like I said, it's really become part of the culture of both the library and the college. And library, individual librarians contribute in whatever way works best for them, whether it's um, our cataloging librarian manages the Blackport bookshelf. And other librarians might serve as a journal editor. So we have a distributed process. OK. Everybody has a hand in. Yes. Um, uh, Susan asked the question uh, of Kim, is research data shared in Brockport's IR, or are all the submissions text-based and articles and monographs, et cetera? That's a really good question. So while we have data in there, and we um, one of the areas that we would like to grow more is in data management. One of our big collections um, is in support of an NSF grant over the years, um, and it's ICMST Institute, which is for STEM teachers. They come in every summer, and one of the things that they have to do is create a lesson plan. So we have the lesson plans for about 10 years, along with the um, files that it, they need for whatever software. And that's our CMFT Institute collection. We also have data in terms of our technical reports and in terms of some government documents. So it's an area that we'd like to expand in in the future, but that's an, um, basically what we have for research data. I'm interested, do you have research data in the SU collection? We actually, um, we had our research data services group um, formed like a year and a half ago. And we're looking at the uh, solutions for research data storage uh, preservation um, on campus. And we decided not to put data into the Commons for now, as as um, probably Digital Commons community all know, they are right now improving their um, services for uh, research data. That have, but I haven't uh, been to a point that you know it's it's uh, fully capacity for the research data. So we kind of know this is has to be um, you know for the research data curation has to be a joint effort on campus, not really uh, only libraries job or uh, responsibility. We are currently um, working with ITS, um, probably provost's office, office of research, trying to come up other solutions. Um, but right now, it's all kind of uh, on the discussion and progression. 
hasn't we haven't really stored any research data in our digital commons yet. We uh, our list our listeners are interested in the costs involved, uh, particularly asking about how DigiCommons charges for its hosted services. So maybe each of you could comment a little bit on that. Okay. So um, my okay. So my understanding is it's um, like a, by FTE, and we liken it to the charge of subscribing to a database. So smaller schools may pay a little less. Larger schools pay a, you know somewhat more. But it's comparable to like you know, subscribing to a database and we get lots more downloads on it than we do on a lot of our databases. Uh, for us, um, we are a fairly large institution and as Kim said, usually the fee is based on FTE. I think we pay somewhere like um, 40 grand a, a year. I mean, a little bit uh, more okay. than that. All right, great. Um, we have a few other questions, and just reminding our listeners that you can chat in your questions. But um, in terms of Yuan, there's a question really about what kind of discussions do your contributors have about long-term preservation, or do you have that kind of conversation with them? Um, yeah, they for our community, like especially faculties, researchers, uh, students, they they really don't think about that. Right. Um, so when we bring it up, they said, "Ah, oh, yeah, yes, yes. How are we going to do that?" So for library, from our library side, um, uh, we are actually pretty active in uh, long-term preservation um, planning. Um, I don't know if you ever heard AP Trust, Academic um, Preservation Trust. It's an organization that trying to um, come out with solutions for um, for long-term digital preservation. Um, I think it also will be. Uh, it's already. Um, a uh, DPN uh, note. Um, so uh, we are trying to work on that. And then uh, they are still working on that. We are part of it. I think we are the, uh, also a funding member for that. Uh, so once, once you know, the, the whole structure is set up, I think we're going to um, need to select um, collections from a uh, special collection from our repository and then for the long-term preservation. Um, and the libraries in the whole is doing that. Another question related to uh, digital archives that you mentioned that you have in the uh, SU repository. Are these things that are born digital, or are they really doesn't make any difference? Um, for university archives projects, most of them are um, digitized, digitized the material. And then um, university archives see us as uh, kind of a digital space that really provided access to those records, those collections, as well as the one, you know, kind of a one backup of a digital. We have one backup in digital scholarship form. Um, I think University Archive also has a dark uh, digital archive space uh, in our university records management system, but we serve um, them as another one, as well as an access point. Okay, and uh, I have a question for Kim about the conference that you mentioned holding, I think you said, in a yearly basis. Can you speak a little bit more about what is in that conference? Sure. Said, so, I think you said the yearly basis. Yeah. Okay, so we have um, actually several conferences within Digital Commons, and two of them, the Graduate Research Conference and the Diversity Conference, uses the digital Commons platform to for uh, presenters to submit their proposals, to communicate with presenters, um, to create the agenda. So the agenda is all online, and that's where um, the attendees go to look for it. Although it's not exclusively online, they still do print out a program. We have the program. We house proceedings, and we offer the opportunity for presenters to upload their presentation, um, which will then have a permanent home. And for many of these graduate students, 
um, they don't really have a place where they put their all their time into making this presentation, and then you know people come to see it or they don't get a chance to see everybody, and it's gone. By having it in Digital Commons, um, people can see it afterwards, and it gives them a home where people can contact them if they're interested. Um, offers them a way to showcase it. You know, for the future, and they get monthly reports on how many people have seen it and downloaded it. Um, so yeah, that's that's basically what I refer to in when I was talking about hosting the conference in Digital Commons. We also have a couple of conferences in Digital Commons where we didn't get involved until after the fact, so it's just more like an archival type of situation. Yes, we also okay. have posters. <laughs> oh, poster sessions. Jane, Jane is asking, do you also have poster sessions as part of the Digital Commons? And your response is yes, correct? Yes. In fact, um, with the recent Conversations in the Disciplines Conference, we have, you could go there and see the poster sessions, um, both pictures, and then if they gave us the actual PDF, that's in there as well. It sounds like a great lot of fun, actually, to have this resource available for everyone. Um, uh, we're almost out of time, so I want to be sure. Uh, there's one last question that I have for both of you. Um, just speak a little bit, very briefly, about what you hope your hope is for the future of the institutional repository uh, and your and your campuses, and and maybe in general. So, uh, Yuan, you first, please. Oh, OK. Um, I really hope, you know, right now we do a lot of promotion and we talk to faculty and students. And then sometimes they even never think about it as, as somebody asks a preservation question. And I don't, I really hope um, the, the access, the open access, and the, the preservation problem, the preservation really become the norm of uh, the culture of on campus. So faculty, uh, students, when they do research and then they're thinking of that at the same time, uh, so that you know it can really embed it in, in their workflow. Once they're done your research and then, then they're starting to think about us, they find us instead of you know every time we have to really look after them. <laughs> so that's my hope. <laughs> Kathy, could you repeat the question? <laughs> um, I, my hope for the future of the IR was that the, the question I part of it. Um, yeah, we really okay, great. We want to see that you know, digital commons become even more embedded in the culture of Brockport. Um, we want to, one of the things that we're really working on is getting graduate departments to submit their theses through digital commons. Um, and I don't know, I, it, it's just like the world is open to us and new opportunities keep coming our way. So that's really about it. That's great. I think we're very close to the end. Um, I do see one other question that's come in here. Uh, has anyone, is anyone anticipating problems with UMI? Uh, are there rights issues uh, connected to the graduate thesis and dissertations that you are uh, depositing? Well, for us, we only have master's theses, so we never submitted anything to URI. And we do contact the um, alumni if they're a print thesis, and they do a click through if it's a current thesis. For us, um, the graduate school, um, yes, I mean, we first of all, we include the thesis and the dissertations in our uh, repository. Um, we have a, my, we have a little bit a different model, uh, which uh, let's see, our students, uh, graduate students, submit uh, dissertations and thesis to UMI, but um, during the process, um, in the UMI submission process, we have our RR as an option 
uh, embedded in their process so that students can choose choose whether or not they want to deposit in the IR and whether or not they want to open access immediately or any embargoes. So they basically, it's their choice. We think the, the, the author is a, a owner. And actually, we get like 98% of open access rate. But we only um, deposit open access uh, digitation thesis in our repository. So far, um, I mean, I hope I hope it's a hundred percent, right? But there is always concerns, especially for students from humanities. Uh, I I understand that um, so far we don't have um, much problem with UMI because the graduate school um, has a kind of long traditional working with them, dealing with dissertations and thesis from like probably 30, 50 years ago. Um, but I do hope um, someday and the students um, can all realize this is. This is a, a good thing to do, and then um, they can um, choose open access to their dissertation and thesis. Um, I I don't see any time um, you am I gonna run out of business, but I just hope a hundred percent open access, which is not probably possible. <laughs> okay, we really are we're really running out of time now. So I, I, I want to thank our guest, Kim Myers from the College of Brockport and Yuan Lee from Princeton University. Um, just a reminder to everyone that this session was recorded and it will be available uh, shortly. You'll get an, an announcement from Deidre about when it is available. It'll be on the NY3R's website. And at that time, too, you can go back and look at all those nice email addresses of people to uh, help you answer all the questions that you had. So I hope you enjoyed this brown bag discussion. And I hope you'll join us next time when we're going to have a pre presentation a little bit different called Library as Publisher, What's Next for New York? Pam McLaughlin from Syracuse University and a member of the I2 New York Library as Publishers Working Group is going to join me. And we're going to wrap up our series and answer any of your questions that you might have about Library as Publisher. We'll also discuss and answer questions on the NY3R's Library as Publisher Innovation Grant Opportunity that's going to be available later this summer. So that discussion is Tuesday, June 3rd at 2 p.m. You can register on the NY3R's website, and there's a slide up there now. I hope to see you then. Before you go, please click on the link that is there and on your screen to complete an evaluation of today's program. And once again, thank you for joining us. And thank you, Kim and Yuan, for a most interesting presentation. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.